you know, you got to can't do that forever. You know, it's not good for you. So praise the Lord for that opportunity. Amen. Thank the Lord for that. All right. Well, uh, he's yelling. It's time to get started. Isn't that right? Usually when he yells, it's time to him or him or him or Timmy back there. It's not my princess back there. Give her a second. She'll be yelling, too. You're like, where are we going tonight? I have no idea. Did I tell you? Did I tell you guys where to go? Oh, that told you. You pay attention, Joshua. Acts chapter 2. We are, you know, I, I've committed to teaching once a week in the book of Acts, at least. So I have to keep with my discipline here. And... Um, it's good for me to do that. I, I want to bring us all along at the same time together through a book of the Bible because I think it's very powerful for a church that we we move forward together through the scriptures like that. And there'll be more after that. I really believe the Lord will probably have me do that uh, from here on out is after we get through Acts, which I don't know when that's going to be. But um, when we do get through it, we'll go to another book. Amen. Maybe Romans. Boy, is that a big one. You think Acts is going to take a while? Romans is going to take a really long time, right? My hair is going to be white by the time we finish it. All white. Yeah, I mean, there's so much there, so much in the Book of Acts, or so much in the Book of Romans, but a lot in the Book of Acts too. So we are actually going to we're going to get a ways today, though. We're going to jump from Acts chapter two, verse number four, all the way to Acts chapter two, verse number thirteen. So we're going to move forward here, a bunch of verses here, because this event that takes place here, uh, this activity of the Holy Spirit is important to understand here, and we're going to get to it here tonight and explain that, uh, Lord willing, and I pray that God opens up your hearts and your understanding to it. Acts chapter 2 and verse number 4, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven, now, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Parthians and Medes, Elamites and dwellers in Mesopotamia, in Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, in Egypt, in the in the, and in the parts of Libya, about Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews, and proselytes, Cretes, and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Remember those for that phrase right there. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Others mocking said, These men are full of new wine. Let's pray. Father, Lord, please... We pray you'd speak to our hearts here as we want to learn from the scriptures tonight. We want you to teach us, Lord. We pray, Spirit of God, that you would bring to our remembrance all things that pertain to these scriptures here tonight, Lord, and open up our understanding to them and help us to follow them, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so now we come to a portion of scripture that is one of the most hotly contested among Christians. When they look at, at Pentecost and what happened, what happened there and speaking in tongues, not that this, these verses are not believed, but that others have stretched them out and to believe and to apply them to things that they shouldn't really try to apply them to, modern day things. The, the, this special gift and outpouring of the Holy Spirit was a one-time event that took place for a specific reason. Many try to replicate or duplicate this event today and believe they have the gift that was given here. However, I don't, I'm going to do something different tonight. I'm not really going to talk about uh, tongues as it is the negative way or the counterfeit tongues. I've dealt with that. If you don't remember those, go back and listen to counterfeit gifts or counterfeit tongues. And, you know, I probably have like four or five different 
messages on there. I want to focus on the actual gift of tongues here tonight that was given and the miracle that took place here. I think that we spent a lot of time in, in dealing with apostasy and, and reproving things. I think we ought to spend more time on that which is right and good and, and what happened and the work that God did here. I think that's, that's valuable because if we dissect how God did this, if we break it down of, of, of what the gift actually was and what happened, it gives us strength to be able to combat those that teach falsely, those that say they are apostles and are not, those that are proved to be liars and false prophets, right? And things of that nature. So I think it's important that we look at this real gift tonight, the real miracle that happened and what took place around it. I believe the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost should be honored and given more time and be glorified in this real gift that took place here. Uh, the saints are edified when we learn the workings of God. When you best understand how God works. See, one of the problems that we have today is that we don't really understand how God works because we don't study the Scriptures enough to find that out. If you and I would study the Scriptures enough, we would find out and understand how God works, and then we wouldn't be as fearful as we are. But in ignorance, we become very fearful because we don't know how God works. We don't understand His ways. Now, some of His ways are above our, our understanding. That's true. But when things are plainly given to us, we ought to study them out. We ought to receive them. We ought to trust God through all these things that happen in our lives and understand that God can miraculously work any time that he wants to. However, God usually uses normal means to work. And uh, that's the normal way that, that, that God deals with things. Natural ways, I should say, but supernaturally led, of course. All right, so number one, these men, they begin to speak with other tongues. It says they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak. I think this is a good point to start out with right here. They didn't speak until the Spirit filled them. Think about that for a second. As Christians, we should be wise not to speak until the Spirit fills us. A lot of things have been said that shouldn't have been, that would not have been said had we been filled with the Spirit of God. Had, had we been filled, then what would come out of us is the Lord Jesus Christ and His goodness instead of the things that do come out of us. The words that we do let slip. We should be wise. We, shouldn't, we should speak less and listen more. I mean that if you and I have been with the Lord and we have followed Him, and he has filled us, then we're ready to speak his words. Some people go out and they try to speak his words and not be filled with the Spirit. Not be filled with the Spirit. Not spend time in devotion with God. Not spend time in, in uh, prayer and time in studying God's Word and, and time close to Jesus. And then you try to do something for God and the effect is not there. The power is not there. And a lot of times we say things we shouldn't say because we're not filled with the Spirit. Amen. A lot of nonsense comes out of our mouths so easily. But listen to what came out of their mouths. mouths. Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. They heard them speak the wonderful works of God. Well, let me ask you, what do men hear you speak? What do they hear? What comes out of your mouth? Mostly, what comes out of your mouth? Is it the wonderful works of God? Do the wonderful works of God pour forth out of your mouth? Or is it always something different? What do men hear you speak? If they were to listen in on your speech and your manner of conversation, would it be the wonderful works of God? Or would it be corrupt communication that proceeds out of your mouth? And that which is not edifying but corrupt communication that proceeds out of your mouth. Would it be evil speaking that would come out of your mouth? Would it always be evil speaking or negativity that comes out? I want you to examine your words. Take a day to examine your speech. Just reflect on your speech. Every one of you, take a day to reflect on your speech. And then find out, does more negative come out of my mouth than more edification and, and things to the glory of God? Do I, do, is it always something bad or evil? You know, one of the things that I've found that the closer I get to the Lord and spend more time with him, the more I am vexed by things that I see online. 
that most Christians, they don't share anymore the glory of God. Most Christians don't share the glory of God with people. They don't share. Have you ever noticed it? I mean, look at it. It's all the most debauched and wicked things that people have to advertise all the time on Facebook and social media now. It's just, and maybe it's because I'm, I, I, I've been, the Lord has brought me closer to him in some ways, and maybe that's why I see it more prevalent now than ever, and it bothers me more now than ever, because all it is, I never see them posting anything that's edifying, that actually looks like they're searching in their Bibles, that actually looks like they're filled with the Spirit, that actually looks like they are walking with Christ. All I see is about, about how many pedophiles there are, how many priests did this, how many people did that? How many how many transgenders there are? How many this? Have you noticed it? It's just all a bunch of filth. It's all that comes out. And I'm telling you, we are being inundated with this garbage constantly. And if you want to have a depressed spirit, if you want to do that, then then follow that stuff too much, and you're going to have that spirit because all you're going to see is what's bad, and that's what Satan wants you to focus on. That's what he wants you to focus on. See, yeah, but we're supposed to repro reprove the unfruitful works of darkness. Absolutely we are. But that's not all we're supposed to do. We're not supposed to glorify him. We don't need to give expositions of him. How about some more expositions of Scripture and a less exposition of evil? Because let me tell you something. How's the, how does the intricate details of the, of the Illuminati and their, and their fornication and their transgenders and, their, and, and the deep psychological sexual dysfunction of society, how does that even help you grow in the Lord? How does that help you become a better Christian? Why? Because I know that? Okay, well, I got a whole book here. And guess what? Paul didn't deal with that every day. Paul's writings are not filled with that every day. What are they filled with? Edification of the saints and building them up in the most holy faith. And what came out of Paul? Christ. That's right. Why? Because he was filled with Christ. He was filled with the Spirit of God. So what came out of him was the Spirit of God. I'm going to tell you what. If you got, you got an over-fascination with that stuff where you got, to, you got to keep talking about it over and over and over and over again, there's something wrong with that. You need to examine, and I'm not, most of you don't, are not on social media, or many of you aren't, so you wouldn't know that or understand that as much. But if you just look at it, Christians, it's like this gotcha thing where they got to have the most, they got to reveal the most awful, wicked, debauched, evil thing and say, look, I got the worst thing now. Here it is. And it's constantly, look, that's not a healthy spiritual diet. Do I do some of those things? Yeah, maybe like one a week or something. If I need to, if I feel led to the Lord to do it, not every article every day, the most wicked thing in the world that you could find the most debased, immoral, disgusting, putrid thing and put it out there so everybody can see it. And then act like you're some champion of the faith. When ask them the doctrines of the word of God, ask them to expound something on scripture. And I bet they couldn't do it. Why? Because they're not taking it in. That's why. They're taking social media and they got to show every evil thing in the world. I'll tell you what, you get too much of a diet that you'll, lo you'll lose your zeal for doing something for God because you'll just give up. You'll just be like, this, this, is, this ain't worth it. Why keep going? I mean, it's all wicked and evil. Yeah, you'll get depressed. Or hearing about uh, the government all the time and thinking about everything with the government all the time. Let me make it easy for you. They're all New World Order, they're all evil. They all worship Satan at the top, and Trump's not a Christian. There you go. I just said it for you. He's placating to the evangelicals. He started the whole abortion train uh, that they're fighting abortion, and abortion's wicked, and all that other stuff because they're, they're playing with the minds of 60- and 70-year-old men out there that are going to vote for them. And, and I was right before, and then people leave because they get mad at that. But anyway, so because they worship Trump, they think he's a great guy after he funded Planned Parenthood. Let me bust your bubble with it, okay? So focus on Christ and the Word of God. Focus on actually growing in your faith because those people are most certainly going to fail you. They are going to be liars, and, they, and Trump is not the savior of this country. He's not going to save this country, okay? Too much blood has been shed in this country. What's going what's gonna to do anything in this country, what could cause the power of God to move, would be Christians that got right with God. 
and not be deceived by people that say they're Christians. But actually follow the word of God. Amen. What would come out of your mouth, though? Would it be murmuring and complaining? What would it be? If we were filled with the Holy Ghost, then we would speak, and we would be a blessing to those that hear us. If we were so filled with the Holy Ghost, then God's word would come like a rushing mighty wind out of our mouths and hearts. So ask yourself, what are you full of? You full of yourself? Guess what comes out of you? Hey, you know what? When you're full of yourself, guess what's co what comes out of you? Pride. It oozes out of you. Because guess what? Nobody's good enough for you. None of, that, none of what they do, for a husband, for a wife, for anybody else, I'm telling you, any relationship you can think of, boss, whatever it is, when you are so full of yourself, everything that comes out of you is pride. And it oozes out of you. That's what happens. That's why you need to be filled with the Spirit like they were. Anyway, we'll move on. I burned enough down. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues. A notable miracle happened here. In order to understand the magnitude of this miracle and its far-reaching aspects, we have to look at all those that were represented there. And we'll get to that in a little while here. And then I'm going to show you kind of where that's from tonight where some of those people were from. So you kind of get a visual, somewhat of a visual understanding in your, in your, in your mind. You can visualize a little bit of, of where these people all came from, how far Pentecost's reach was. I mean, you're still feeling it today. We're right here, amen? So, so what's going on here right now is there are Jews that are dwelling at Jerusalem. They're devout men out of every nation under heaven. Jerusalem is swarming with men from every nation. Everywhere. So it's a figure of speech and somewhat, you know, but it's, it's giving you an example of how many people there were. There were a lot, okay? Um, he lists the nations that, that were there that were present. When we see, now, but when we see nations and tongues, we, st we have to understand the real miracle that took place at Pentecost. Turn to Genesis chapter 10, verse number 31, because tongues is an important thing to interpret. Uh, no pun intended, but it is, it is important to be able to interpret what the Bible is speaking of when it says tongues in this context. Genesis 10, 31 says this, these are the sons of Shem after their families. Look at this, after their tongues in their lands. After their nations, these are the families of the sons of Noah after their generations in their nations. And by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. So what do we have here? We have tongues. We have nations, right? We have generations. We have nations. We have families. What is it speaking of? The language they spoke. That word, that's the word tongue. It means glossy. It means a language. It's an actual language. Okay. And you can tell the context there that it is speaking of each one of them and their dialects that they had, their languages that they that they spoke. All right? It's very clear. Revelation 7, 9. After this I beheld and lo, a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Okay, so what does it say here? It says the same thing. It gives you kindreds and nations. It's speaking of languages. If no one taught you that tongue speaking was a bunch of babble, you have to be taught that because when you read the scriptures, you don't get that. When you read the scriptures, you get that those were languages that were spoken and they were represented by different nations there. And that's why the nations are listed because they have different languages. Okay. And somebody has to teach you the charismatic doctrine. They have to teach you that because a simple rendering of the scriptures, a simple reading of the scriptures uh, shows you that they were languages, real languages. And that was the miracle that took place. Revelation 10, 11. And he said unto me, thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Again, there's the other example of that, okay? Another example, Revelation 11:9, 9. 
And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. So then I believe it's safe to say from the biblical interpretation and just a reading of Scripture that nations and tongues were are used in dealing with what this miracle was, that they were able to hear it. They were able to hear in their own language, and they understood it. Another point here that we see at Pentecost is that no interpreter was needed for those who heard them speak. There was no interpreter needed here. They all understood. They all understood. Isn't that something? Every single one of them. And there was a lot of speaking going on. There wasn't just one person speaking. Okay? Picture this. The Spirit falls on all 120 that are in that upper room. You understand that, right? It wasn't just the apostles. It was all of them. The Spirit fell on all of them. So when the Spirit falls on all of them, and they all begin to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So let me set this up for you. Let's say that Let's say that you were standing outside where they were at and you heard that rushing mighty wind, right? Because they heard it. It was meant to draw a crowd. Do you understand that? And then when you start to hear all that, then the spirit falls on these men and then you start to hear them talking and you're walking around and, and all the noise abroad is coming to you. So you're a Parthenian and you're down, you're like down the street or you're like down a ways away and wait a minute, I just heard, they're speaking the wonderful works of God in my language, and I can understand it. So what do they do? What would you do? Well, let me ask you, what would you do? If you were down the street from this, and you heard some guy down there, you're in Jerusalem. You don't even live there, right? You're coming to visit, right? And you hear a man speak in your language. There. What are you going to do if you're standing here? You're going to go over there, and you're going to be like, what's this guy doing? What's going on here? So there started to be crowds that came. They're like, what's going on here? How do we know that? Well, because all of these nations that are represented, those people were all there. And it was noised abroad. It was coming that something's going on. Right? Something's happening here. So it was a mighty move of the Spirit of God that took place here. It was used for what? For communication. To be a witness. That's what it was for. Is it not amazing that when we see all the talk about the gift of tongues today, that it is never used for what it was at Pentecost? Today in modern churches that practice what they call speaking in tongues, no one is edified. No one is truly brought under conviction of the Holy Ghost, and no one is pointed to Jesus Christ. See, let me warn you of something. This is what happens when you let feelings trump Scripture. You see the gifts of the Spirit there in the Bible, and you hear about that, and you're like, well, I want that too. So some guy comes along and tells you some church does. Well, you can learn this. How do you? No, you, yeah, smack you on the head or whatever. No, you can't learn that. It's given to you. If it was given to you, then you wouldn't need to learn it. Here's the other thing, and nobody can pass it on to you. All right? No one gets saved from the nonsense that goes on today in those churches. No one, because it's not about them getting saved. It's an emotional hype or a pretend gift. That's what it is. Remember, men got saved when tongues were preached after the sermon was preached. We're going to get to that. That's important. Speaking in tongues never saved anybody. It didn't save them at Pentecost. Because they spoke in tongues, no one got saved at Pentecost. That is not what, what men got saved from. We'll show you that in a little while here. Next, let's look at the reactions when the, when the reach and the reach of that miracle. Now, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together. The Bible says, you'll notice that God used this and he gathered the crowds together with it. The purpose was that this gospel would be preached to every nation starting first in Jerusalem. Now, here's where it gets interesting, because Jesus specifically fulfilled this, what he told them he would do, specifically. They knew that this was coming. They just didn't understand how it was coming. I don't believe, I knew Jesus said, you get in there, you go back to Jerusalem, you get to praying, and you wait for the promise of the Father, and you ain't going to miss it. 
<laughs> I added that, but <laughs> but, <laughs> but you, no problem. You're not going to wonder if it's him or not, okay? You're going to know. Now, how are you going to know? Well, Jesus told him, didn't he? Turn to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, verse number 45. On the road to Emmaus, these, these people were not listening. Uh, these saints, they were not listening to Jesus, and he was getting a little, little uh, intense with them, right? He said, oh, fools and slow of heart. I like A.W. Pink preaches a great message called Christian Fools. You ought to, you ought to listen to it. Yep. It's a good message. I heard it a long time ago, a couple times. You ever heard it? Christian Fools. It's a good one, isn't it? Yeah. Luke 24, 45. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and said unto them, thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all what? Nations. Well, w wait a minute. Okay, he said among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And what did he say? And ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endowed with power from on high. He told them exactly that's what was going to happen. What are you going to send there? You're, you, you need to go there. You're going to preach the gospel. You need to wait there. You're going to preach it to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Wait there. So he fulfilled the promise. He fulfilled his promise. The crowds had gathered. See, he told them all this. He told them all this when they didn't believe that he was alive. You know, he's like, so he, he takes them through all the, by the way, that must have been one intense conversation. Because he showed them out of the Psalms, out of the prophets and the law, all things that pertained unto Christ. <laughs> like, Wow. What a conversation he had with them on the road to Emmaus, right? I think that's the road to Emmaus, wasn't it, when he, when he found them? I can't remember. I'm pretty sure it was. But anyway, they were walking along, and he found them walking, and they were, like, disappointed at some things. And Anyway, so he finds them, and he's talking to these disciples, and he's telling them what's going to happen, all right? And they were shocked, to say the least. But imagine hearing these Galileans speak in your own native tongue. It was a shock and surprise. These are devout. These were devout men, many out of every nation. Under so these were godly men that were already searching for God. They wanted to know. They wanted to know the Lord. They were searching for Him. So it's interesting to note that. All right, now Acts chapter two here. Uh, let's see. And now when the noise. Now this. Now when this was noised abroad in verse number 6, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. So it says here, the next point we ought to look at is they were confounded. Now this is an interesting word. And if you're paying attention to your Bible, you're going to see something that's, that's really interesting here. Let's look at this word here. It says they were confounded. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 6 says, This is the way that not to be confounded. Wherefore also it is contained in the Scriptures. Behold, I, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Now Peter's going to preach a little bit later, and then he's going he's to fix their confounded problem. Amen? That's what preaching does. It fixes some of those problems. The Lord uses that. Matthew chapter 4, verse number 16. The people which sat in darkness saw great light, and unto them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light has sprung up. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So Jesus said that there's going to come a time, you know, that light's going to come. Lights are going to go on. Amen. What does that word mean, confounded? It means mixed or blended in disorder, perplexed, dismayed. Put to shame in silence, astonished. Means to throw into disorder. But I think it's interesting because this problem gets solved by Peter, right? But it takes us back to another time this word was used that's very important. 
because it links the two together. Genesis chapter 11, verse number 7. This links it together and gives the answer for the confounded problem. And also did away with the curse of the languages. Genesis chapter 11, verse number 7. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language. So the Holy Spirit of God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, all there said, okay, let's go down there, and let's go confound their language. That they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth. And from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. So here, that they're confounded back in Pentecost, right? Isn't that interesting how that links those two together? Both languages. Do you see that? And by the way, both of those are literal languages. Languages that were separated at, at uh, Babel and languages that were unlocked, tongues that were loosened, loosened, right? They were loosed. And understanding came to them, right? That's what the Lord does. That's when you know, when the Holy Spirit works, guess what? Things get simple. They start to make sense. You know what? When you don't follow God, your life gets harder. It gets confounded. You become perplexed. You become dismayed. You become disoriented. You become confused. You become perplexed, don't you? What is it? Uh, Alistair Crowley, when he died, he said, I am perplexed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you were. Because you served the devil your whole life and you got to the end and figured out that you're going to go meet him. You're going to burn him for all of eternity there. Mm -hmm. But see, it says that they were that they were confounded. They didn't know what to think. They were perplexed. They were a little confused. Next, it says, though, they were all amazed. Now, this is an interesting word. I think sometimes you don't understand the definition of this word. Um, and I don't. I'll, I'll be honest with you. Until I studied it, I, I wondered about it a little bit. But it says that word amazed, the definition of it is astonished, confounded with fear, surprise, or wonder. So they wondered at it. They were confounded with fear. So great fear. Well, let me ask you a question. Again, if you're walking down the street, you don't know anybody here. Nobody speaks your language at all. And you're walking down the street here, and all of a sudden, that guy over there starts speaking the wonderful works of God, and, and you're like, well, I need to go over there. And it's like, how's this guy doing this? Because that guy's like a dumb fisherman. All right, he's just a dumb Galilean. What's he doing, you know? That was a derogatory term for those that followed Christ. So what's this? What's that guy doing? What's that dummy doing over there? How can he? How can he can talk to me like that? And how is he able to tell me the wonderful works of God? If you were in a foreign country somewhere, let's say you were, let's say you were out on a remote island. Okay, and you didn't know their language at all, and they didn't know your language. Okay, they had never had anybody from the outside come, and you walked up to that island, and those guys started speaking English to you. What would that do to you? Yeah, you would, you would be sore amazed, wouldn't you? You would be like, oh, man, this is weird. Yeah, yeah, this is, this is really strange. How in the world can this person talk to me? How do I understand what they're saying? How do they understand what I'm saying? Right? That's what happened. But that word amazement, now, I want to put it in context for you. First Peter 3, 6, Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are as long as you do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. Right? You're not afraid. Right? Not afraid to obey. Think about that. Anyway, it's used again in verse number 12 of, the, of, of Acts chapter 2. And they were all amazed and were in doubt. It brought fear upon them and amazement. They became full of fear and perplexed as to how this could happen. 
and they spoke it perfectly. You know, it's like, it's kind of like this. If you were Irish, right? If you were you had took an Irishman, right? And you dropped him over in, I don't know, Russia, right? And he's speaking perfectly, accent and all, perfect Russian. You'd be like, how is that even possible? He never went to school. He never learned. He never, that's what happened. And that's why they were so amazed. That's why they were afraid. You know? Because who are these men? These guys aren't linguists. These guys aren't like intelligent, highly intelligent doctors of of uh, of Judaism or that. They're not. They're not. They're not these men. Look at them. They're look at their clothes. Look at who they are. See, that's the miracle. Next, it says they marveled. What does that mean? They kept wondering. They marveled. God's they, they became in a, a kind of a frantic and nervous state. You don't think about that, do you? You think, well, no, they would just be praising God and everything. No, they're a little afraid because they're trying to figure out how they're hearing about God in their own tongue from these men. And these men are probably they're not preaching the gospel. It does not say that they they spoke the gospel in tongues. It does not say they did that right there. When they initially came to them, it says they spoke the wonderful works of God, right? That's what it says. It doesn't say they preached the gospel at that point. In fact, Peter's the one that preached the gospel. Peter's the one that ends up preaching the sermon, which we're not going to cover tonight because we don't have time. But they kept wondering, what's going on here? But God's power can and will do that to people that are unconverted. They'll wonder at it. What does that mean to, to, to marvel? It means that which arrests the attention. And causes a person to stand or gaze or to pause. They are stopped. They are halted at the miracle and do not know where it came from. How do we hear every man in our own tongue? Acts 13.40 says, Beware, therefore, lest that come upon you which is spoken of in the prophets. Behold, ye despisers, and wonder and perish. For I work a work in your days, a work which you shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. Amen. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So then it was a miracle of speaking in other tongues. Some men try to contradict the Scripture and say, well, it was just in the hearing. No, it doesn't say that. It says that they spoke all of these different languages. They spoke them. Now, they said, how hear we? Now, we're not going to explain that tonight because Peter's going to tell them how this all comes about. Peter's going to preach to them. There's nothing better than to have people ask you questions like that when you're preaching. (laughs) You know, when something happens like that, you want them to. You know, you, you want them to ask questions like that. Especially these lost people, they want to know how this happened. I want you to notice that it was the gospel that saves these men in the end here. It's not the miracle of tongues that saved them. God used it to start a Holy Ghost fire. He used the gospel to save them. Peter preaches a sermon. It's not the tongues that that caused those men to be saved. That was the fire that was started. So that, yeah, so they could understand it. They could come out and look and see what was going on, right? But Romans chapter 1, verse number 16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. It is not, listen, there are people out there that want to see a miracle. They say, oh, if you just show me a miracle, I'll believe. No, you won't, you liar. The Bible, that look, it doesn't matter. We don't have to be able to perform miracles. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. It is the gospel that saves. It is Jesus that uses the gospel, his death, his burial, his resurrection. It is the gospel that saves men. It is the gospel that has the power to pull a man from death to life. 
That is what raises men from the dead, is the gospel. It is nothing else. The gospel is the power of God. I don't care what you are and what you've done and how far away you've been. The gospel has the power of God. It is the power of God and the salvation. I don't care how dead you think someone is or how far beyond you think they are. God is able to raise the dead. And he's able to do it, and he does it with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is what he uses. It is the gospel, and always will be the gospel, is what saves. And it's what men need to get back to preaching. It's what this country needs so bad. It's not kowtowing to these stupid, foolish, pagan, perverted politicians. It is preaching the devil out of them. That's what's going to change them. That's what's the power of God. And that's what they've lost sight of. And that's, and that's why we have no power today. I'm going to tell you what, you'll never convince me that the gospel doesn't change a man. I'm living proof of it. I know what it does, and I know how it can pull you out of the gutter. I know what God's word can do. I was quickened by it. I was made alive by it forevermore. I was changed forever by it. I know what it is. And I'm going to tell you what, if you're in sin right now or you're not living right for God, it's that same gospel that pulls you out. It is that same power of God unto salvation that pulls you from the death that you're near back to life in him. You need to remember the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what the power is of salvation. That's what that's the power of Pentecost. You want the power of Pentecost? It's the gospel. Because the Holy Ghost. Breathes on that gospel message. He breathes life into men. He breathes life into them, and that's what men need. Is the gospel. You know, you can go on, you can have a thousand counseling sessions with people, and you can do all these other things, and you can try to. I got some booklet about transgenderism today from some family council people or something else, and I'm going to tell you what, after it's all said and done here with all this stuff here, this, this, they send me this book here. These, they're supposed to be Christians, and I don't know, they probably are. I don't know who they are. But anyway, this parent resource guide and all this stuff, and transgender this, and how to deal with that, and how to talk to this, and how to talk to that. Let me tell you something, friend. It's the gospel. That's what it is, and that's all it is. That's a bunch of trash probably from the pit of hell anyway. Uh, Let me tell you what it is. It is the gospel that saves a man. It is the gospel that pulls you out of your dirty, old, wicked, rotten, devilish self that is is on a spider web dangling above hell, ready to fall into it. It is the gospel that saves a man, changes a man, makes him a new creature. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. You try to go back to that pig pen, it's that gospel that will pull you right back out of it. It's the gospel that saves a man. It's a gospel that changes a man. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it always has been and it always will be. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. It is a bloody gospel. It is an absolutely bloody gospel because it took every drop of blood to save your rotten soul. That's why. Because you love your sin and iniquity. And it took a bloody gospel to save you. All of the blood. All of it. And I'm telling you what, if you think you're okay with sinning against that blood, you're going to find out God's going to deal with you. God don't let his people live like that. He don't let his children live like that. You wouldn't let yours live like that. He won't let his either. And he's a way better father than we are. You get out of line with God, he's going to take that rod and he's going to hook you back in. Kicking or screaming, however way you want to go. Shouting or pouting, it don't matter. You're going. He'll deal with you. You better get right with God. You better humble your heart before God. It's the gospel that's the power of God. I don't need to speak in tongues tonight. It's the gospel that saves. That's why these guys, that's why Paul is dealing with them in 1 Corinthians 14. He said, you guys are playing like child's play, like you're, you're playing kitty games still. You want to you wanna play all these games with speaking in tongues and interpretations and all this other stuff. That, that's, that's not important. What's important? The gospel. 
And all that we do ought to, all that we do in our personal lives and all that we do as a church ought to promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. It ought to be what it does. And all that you do in your life ought to promote the gospel. After all, Christ saved you and shed his blood. If that don't make you want to do something for him, nothing will. I'm sorry. There ain't no begging or pleading a pastor can do for you. There ain't no, th- th- there ain't, there ain't no counseling session I can give you. There ain't nothing else I can do for you. If you don't love Jesus Christ enough to do something for him after he saved your soul, I would question whether he saved Saved your soul. Amen. For what love is this? That that a man would lay down his life for his friends. Christ lays down his life for you and you turn your back on him? You grow cold on him? It's the gospel that's the power of God. It always has been, always will be. We need to take it out. We need to use it more. We need to preach it more in our lives. We need to hand out more gospel tracts. We need to keep him so busy that we got to order 10,000 at a time. That's what ought to be happening. How many are you getting out? How much of that gospel are you sharing with people during your week? How many times are you handing a tract to somebody? Are you giving anybody? Does anybody even know you're a Christian? How many times? Are you afraid that somebody at work might know you're, you, you're a Christian? Are you afraid of that? Huh? Are you afraid they might accuse you of being a Christian? Huh? Is that what you're afraid of? They might actually accuse you of being a Christian. Boy, that'd be a terrible thing, wouldn't it? Huh? Or your mom or your dad or your family members or other people might know you're a Christian. Amen. They ought to know. Why do we have to hide it? Why should we hide what we believe? Why should we hide it? The queers ain't hiding nothing. The sods aren't hiding nothing, are they? The transgenders aren't hiding anything. Disney ain't hiding nothing. Huh? Why are you? I wasn't planning on saying any of that, but praise the Lord. That's Amen. Amen. We need that. We need some more of that. You know, I, I'll, I'll be honest with you. We, we need a tad bit more of that fundamentalism back in us. I'm going to tell you that right now. That's one of the things. You say what you want to about those people, but at least they went. At least they had a desire to go. At least they're witnessing to people. Amen. You think about that for a minute. At least, they're, at least they didn't lose their first love in that sense. They may be wrong about a thousand other things, but I firmly believe the reason why some of them are still around is because people still do get saved. Amen. They ought to have a desi- you ought to have a desire like that. See, you can swing the other way too far. Life is about being centered on Christ, walking the narrow way. And there's a danger on each side. One of the dangers is about, uh, you know, one of the dangers about rebuking a false system is going too far the other way. Right? Going absolutely too far the other way. The errors of fundamentalism, yeah, there's a ton of them. There's also a lot of good things about it, too. And you can't ignore that either. You know, you do that at your own peril. And that's happened. And, and you know what? It happens. And you know what? You, you, can't, you can't walk away from all of it. The truth of it needs to be upheld. And there's truth there. Maturity will let you see that. But I want you to understand something. Obviously, I don't agree with their one, two, three, repeat after me. But you know what I agree with less? You not saying anything at all. Amen. I mean, yeah, we're against one, two, three, repeat after me. We understand that's wrong and everything else. But you know what? I'm more against not saying nothing at all. Our hearts ought to be burdened. We need to do more. We've not done enough. We need to do more. We need to give our lives for the gospel's sake to get the gospel to people. We live in freedom. We live in liberty still. We have the answer. 
We have the only answer. The only answer. For whatever problem they have, we have the answer. Whatever. I'm not advocating their errors. I'm saying at least they're going. At least they're telling. At least in their lives they witness to you. Man, my old pastor, he was a one, two, three, repeat after me guy. God bless him. He's 80, 80 some years old. He's getting ready to die. He doesn't have much time left. He can only stay up, what, a couple hours a day? A couple hours a day. But you know what? I don't. If you go anywhere with that man, he will start witnessing to anybody. And them old fundamentalists were like that, man. You, you start with, I mean, he ran them all through prayers and all kinds of <laughs> things that I wouldn't do anymore, and I don't agree with that. Okay, but you know what? I don't think I'd be here today if it wasn't for him. In fact, I know I wouldn't be because God used him because God uses means. He uses people. Stop looking for a, a, fl a flaming tongue from the sky and realize that God uses people. He uses you and he uses me to do something for him. Right. Stop looking for some miracle when the miracle's already been given to you. That's right. But that old man, you know what? He... He, anywhere he goes, man, he's 80. He can't hardly stand up. He can hardly stay awake for two hours. But you know what he's doing? He goes somewhere. He's witnessing to his doctors and his nurses are taking care of him. He's preaching to them. Yeah. And he said two of them got saved. I don't know if they got saved or not, but I'm just telling you he did it. At least they got a witness. Amen. At least they got a witness. What's better for us not to open our mouth at all? Being afraid that we don't do it perfectly? Or tell them about the Lord. Witnessing to them. We've got to change our mindset. It's got, to, it's got to change. This world is getting dark. And the only light they have is us. That's it. Ye are the light of the world. Amen. Now in closing here. I think that's closing. Yeah, it is. Okay. Whew. Jacob's wiping the sweat off his brow. He's like, Phew. man, I get out of here now. It says others mocked, saying they were drunk, right? They mocked him, filled with new wine, right? That's what they said to him. Oh, actually, that's not the close of this. <laughs> I may have to wait for the other part. You might, anyway, we'll see. I'll hurry here. Um, let me ask you. It says that they, they mocked them. They falsely accused them. They mocked them. Does our church make people think we're crazy? Sometimes, yeah. Or mad or drunk or something, right? You see, it makes them, people's reaction. When you do something for God and you're preaching the truth of God's word, I don't mean like you're acting like a belligerent fool, but you're just preaching the word of God. And you can back it up in that book, and you can see it in there very clearly, and you have the right spirit about it. The world is going to be perplexed. They're going to criticize you. They're going to call you names, and they're going to lay false accusations against you. Why? That's what they have to do. That's what those men did there. Otherwise, they have to believe your report. So if I don't want to believe your report, then I'm just going to make something up. You guys are some kind of crazy cult. Right? You guys are Westboro Baptist. You guys are some kind of crazy cult. You guys drank the Kool-Aid. Oh. Full of new Kool-Aid. That's right. <laughs> Full of new Kool-Aid. Are you the Duggars? No, we're not. There, there's going to be all sorts of stuff said for following fundamental doctrine. When the word is preached on the streets, they think we're taken by something. Hey, man, you people need help. Y'all yeah. messed up. Your aura's wrong. You got something wrong with your chakra. You leave my shockery alone, buddy. My aura is just fine, wherever it is, I think. I once seen a lady doing that one time. I heard about her doing that. She did all this aura stuff. She was like, oh, oh, you need vitamin C. <laughs> like, how do you know that? He just touched somebody's head. You know they need that? Yep, yep. Oh, there's a block right there. Yeah, blockhead, I know. I, I preached to him. I know he's got a blockhead. Yeah. It's true. I, I agree. 
I agree. Most Baptists do. It's true. No, that's what they, that's what they did. That's what this lady did. She was doing all that stuff too. Yeah. Anyway, they'll say there's something wrong with you, right? Your aura's off. They want you to get a psych evaluation, right? That's what they want to do on Christians today. Mm-hmm. You're crazy. Must be drinking that new wine. When the word of God is preached on the streets or anywhere else, they're going to think we're taking something or there's something wrong with us. They mock us. They shout out. What do they shout? Spaghetti monster. Or science, my favorite word. Or at the Slayer concert. Slayer! I never did figure out what that meant. I was like, what does that mean exactly? Why, why do you keep saying that to me? Jacob was like, I'm taking that guy out. <laughs> Just kidding. They surround the pulpit, right? They try to shout us down. You've seen that before. Did they, didn't they say the same thing to Paul? Paul, much learning does make thee mad. Paul, you're crazy, man. What's wrong with you? I'm not. I'm not mad, most noble Festus. <laughs> I know he answered very meekly. <laughs> I'm not mad, most noble Festus. <laughs> you must be on something, they say, right? Well, on the rock, Christ Jesus, amen? Filled with the Holy Spirit, I pray. But they're, they're going to be some that they're going to refuse the message, just like they did at Pentecost. They're going to laugh at them. They're going to mock them. That's going to happen. That's going to be part of it. You have to understand that. That's what, they, that's what they're going to think. Why? Because they don't know the Spirit of God, and they don't want to. They love their sin, right? They don't want to answer that, that God of the Bible. Well, quickly, <clears throat> let me just give you a few of these, then we'll get out of here, okay? Um, I just want you to understand some of the reach that they had here, because we didn't really talk about these. I, I, I quoted the verse to you there, but all these areas, okay, it says... Uh, you know, the different languages, the Parthians. OK, who were they? The Parthians were inhabitants. This is what God used. OK, this message was given and all of these men left and went home and took the gospel message with them. Do you understand that? All of them. That's what God used. The Parthians were inhabitants of a mountainous and fertile country south of the Caspian Sea, bounded on the north by Hyrcania, on the south by Carmania on the west by Media, and on the east by Ariana. Anyway, so they were, they, that's where they were over by, let's see, the, a formidable nation and extended their sway from India to the Tigris and from Khorasmia to the Indian Ocean. So vast area that these people are from. They were the most dreaded, perhaps, of all the foes of the Roman Empire. And they're there that day, okay? Next, the Medes. We know who the Medes are, right? Their country is said to have been bounded on the north by the part of the Caspian Sea and on the south by Persia, Susiana, and part of Assyria. And on the east by Parthia. And like Parthia, it was, a mount, it was mountainous in character. It now forms the northwestern part of the kingdom of Persia. So that's where that was, okay? So far-reaching. The Elamites. They were inhabitants of that province of old Persian and Babylonian empires known as Susiana. At, it lay north of the Persian Gulf, being bounded by the Tigris on the west, Media on the north, and Persia on the south and east. They were of the Semitic origin. The word Elam, however, is often used synonymous with Persia. Mesopotamia. The word means that which is between the rivers to denote the country between the Euphrates and the Tigris. It was known among the Hebrews of the Old Testament as Aram Naram in Genesis chapter 24. It lay northwest of Elam and west of Media. Uh, of course, you know where Judea was. Cappadocia, the enumeration now proceeds in natural order to Asia Minor. Cappadocia was a large country in the east of Asia Minor, northwest of Palestine. It was administered at this period by a procurator, procurator uh, appointed by the Roman Empire. It was bounded on the south by uh, and, and on the north by the Pontus and the east of Armenia and Mesopotamia. So all these countries, I should have brought Aaron's big, huge globe to make the flat earthers go crazy. But um, I didn't. Anyway, so all of Asia. He talks about Asia here. The name Asia in the New Testament always denotes the Roman province, so-called. This was formed in 133 B.C., being placed under the government of a proconsul. 
It was known as the Proconsular Asia. It embraced the western part of the peninsula of Asia Minor, including Mysia, Lydia, Korea, and most of Phrygia. Its chief city was Ephesus. So think about that. These things are, and you can look some of these names up in your Bible to see where Paul was too after this, because some of these seeds were planted, right? Uh, Pergamos and Smyrna were also very important towns in it. So remember those churches in, in Revelation? Pergamos, Ephesus, Smyrna. That was a place of revival. That whole area was. So you could see that all those churches were real strong and powerful churches at the time. Where did it start? Right here at Pentecost. They took the gospel back there. Many of them did. Pamphylia, a country on the south coast of Asia Minor, bound on the east by Cilicia and the west of Lycia, and on the north of Mount Taurus. Okay, so that's where that is. In Egypt, of course, we know where Egypt is. Uh, the parts of Libya about Cyrene, sojourners from Rome. They actually came from Rome, all the way from Rome. So uh, Fergia was a large district of Asia Minor lying east of the proconsular Asia and having Bithynia on the north and Galatia on the east, the Church of Galatia, right? Paul wrote letters to them, all right? So there you see these Jews and proselytes, Cretans. Here the enumeration turns eastward again. Crete, now called Candia, is an island of the Mediterranean 60 miles south of Greece. It is 156 miles long and varies in breadth from 7 to 30 miles. Its original inhabitants were most probably kindred with those of Asia Minor. Under the Romans, it was joined by Cyrene and became a senatorial province. Jewish settlers were very numerous there. And the Arabians, which was anything from uh, between the mainlands of Asia and Africa, stretching betwixt the Red Sea and the Persian Gulf. So all of these people, that's just a short list kind of, but all these people all over the place, from all over the place, the gospel spread forth. They went home, started that. And then you'll notice that Paul later on went through those areas and he preached. And people were saved and churches were started. And we see that God used Pentecost at the time to spread. That was the harvest, right, that was to spread through the whole world. So we have our own harvest here. We have our own work, our own white fields here that we have to get busy. And it's every day in your lives, every day, there's somebody that needs the gospel that's around you. And you pray to the, whole, you pray to the Lord that the Holy Spirit would make you sensitive, okay, that the Lord would make you sensitive and the Holy Spirit would direct you and guide you to the person that you need to witness to, that God would have you to witness to, the opportunity that you have. Let me ask you a question. If you saw somebody so down and out, distraught, would your heart break for them that you would want to give them the gospel? Would you? Or would you just say, oh, I hope you feel better? Or if they were in need and you saw that they were in need, they were distraught. Would you try to give them the gospel? Would you try to give them the only answer that can cure them? The only, the only antidote for their pain and suffering? The only way they can be made whole? No matter what their problem is. If it's life, then Christ can give them life. If it's death and they're going to die, then Christ can give them peace for death. If it's depression and discouragement, then Christ can give them joy. He's the only one that can sustain you through it all. And Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. And you and I must abide in Christ so we have the power of God, so we can get out there and do more for him. In our daily lives, be a witness. Let them know the truth of the gospel before it's too late. Men are dying all around us. They are dying. We have the only thing that can, the only truth, the only way, the truth, and the life that can give them eternal life so when they pass from this life they go on to the next one to be with the lord forever it's not the it's not the power of tongues it's the power of the gospel remember that father lord please help us help us to have be filled with the spirit lord so then we speak men will listen oh god we pray for the holy ghost of god to come down upon us lord and rain on our hearts and reign in our hearts, Lord, and fill us with your spirit and give us your power. Lord, that we could preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, that men would be saved, that their lives would be changed. They would be saved from the penalty of sin, the pleasure of sin, the power of sin, and one day the presence of it, Lord, please. We pray, Father, that we'd be a light 
to a lost and dark, dying world. Help us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.